Welcome again. This is Juan Soto. I'm an Access MVP, one of only 17 in the world. Tonight's topic is going to be uh, SQL Server Academy, and second course, intermediate. We did the beginner's course last month. A couple of things about last month. I, I'm hoping you, everyone here did take it. If you didn't, that's no problem. You can go see the video. Susan Pine, who's our chapter coordinator, she's our online moderator. So if you're having problems with your audio video or need help or have any general questions regarding Microsoft Access SQL Server, she's also a senior Access developer. And we're hoping that one one day soon another access MVP. So uh, Susan is here if you need any help. Uh, oh, a couple of things from the in, in beginner's course I uh, want to highlight that are super important. Number one, we talked about first resolve any issues you currently have and answer before you migrate to SQL Server. Super important because those issues will get magnified once you get to uh, SQL Server, right? So spaces in your field, spaces in table names. Uh, lack of indexes, lack of primary keys, uh, all these issues that you know, SQL Server is not going to resolve for you. Bad database design is just going to get worse. Well, the SQL Server, make sure you use the latest drivers. We talked about ODBC 17 and MS ODB 18. And uh, yeah, we talked about how SQL Server was the best thing to happen with Microsoft Access, as well as SQL Server Express. I told you most of my clients. Uh, before we were migrating. Now we, mo most people go to the cloud. We help them migrate to the cloud. That's another class entirely. But uh, most of our clients, before we do the cloud, we were doing SQL Server Express, which is the best thing ever happened to Access. It makes it a lot more stable, um, avoids crashes, right? And uh, I'm not saying that you're going to avoid, have not have crashes. It's going to be less crashes than you have back end. And it takes care of a lot of people. You can put 25, 30 people on SQL Server Express, no problem, on a network. So it's a great product. Hey, I wanted to let you guys know that uh, we've been doing a campaign on my LinkedIn profile. Uh, it's called uh, Access Tip of the Day here. So I'm showing this is one of my uh, recent one a week ago. Every day I'm releasing a tip on LinkedIn. So uh, please subscribe to that tip of the day on either our Twitter or LinkedIn. I appreciate that. If you guys like my tweets, my tweets or my LinkedIn post, that would be great. I also wrote a very interesting <laughs> post on my LinkedIn profile. Uh, let me see if I can show it to you guys here. Let's see here. Are you seeing my screen, guys? Can you give me confirmation? Yes. Cool. All right, thank yes. you. Yeah, I wrote a very interesting. From time to time, I'll write a um, post on my profile <clears throat> here. Here we go. I think it's a post or articles. Let me see articles. Oh, okay. Footballs from the devil, uh, one reason I don't mention sports to my clients. So I'm going to give you a link to this if you want to read this interesting article. Basically, I don't talk three topics with customers, sports, religion, <laughs> and politics. And um, one time I was talking to a client of mine, and I made a comment about football, and that's what the response she gave me back. So, uh, yeah, interesting read. So if you want to go check that out, go ahead and do that. And... Uh, Let's go ahead and talk about today's topic, which is about uh, intermediate. So today, what we're going to do here is we're going to discuss um, we're going to discuss um, how to migrate a database with SQL Server Migration Assistant. And so I'm going to share another monitor I have here. Stop sharing and share this other monitor. Give me a second here. And share. And screen two. All right. Okay, great. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a access database. Now, usually when you do this, you already have a uh, database in question, like maybe from a customer of your own. You want to create access. So I'm just going to go in here, and I'm going to click on Northwind database. And that's going to download the template from uh, the web. So I'm going to call this uh, Test SQL Server Academy. .accdb, and I'll let it store it in my, my documents. And so what that does, it downloads the template from the Microsoft Cloud, expands it, and then you got to click on Enable Content. And now uh, just click on Login, and now here's your database. Now, the reason I picked this Northwind database is it really comes pre-populated with data, and we'll be talking about that in a second. So now I created my database, I'm going to exit out of here, and I'm going to launch SQL Server Migration Assistant which is a wonderful tool that's going to easily allow you to migrate this data. 
Now I have the latest version installed. Notice that it is version 32-bit. I usually pick the bitness of the Office I have installed. So there's a 64-bit, 32-bit. So if I have Office 64, I usually pick the um, SQL Server Migration Assistant 34, 64, excuse me. So uh, I'm gonna click on next here. It's gonna give my give my type project a title. So SQL Server, Server Academy. And notice that the first tip, notice that it wants to know where you're going to. Now, so it happens that the last time I used this, I picked the right server, but this is my local server out of this workstation, SQL Server 2019. Now, when I develop on my local workstation, I get the developer edition of SQL Server, which is just like the enterprise, but it only allows one connection at a time. So I'm gonna pick 2019, I'm gonna click on next. Now I'm gonna click on add databases. I'm gonna pick the one I just created and next. Now, uh, before this version, um, it would be problematic because if you had Office 365, uh, the engine for Office, uh, the engine for access was uh, in a wall, walled off garden. So SQL Server Migration System couldn't get to it. But uh, the team, the Microsoft Access team has really made uh, a dent into that. And now they've exposed it via ODBC and now uh, the assistant can then do this. Otherwise, you have to install uh, the engine for Microsoft Access Engine. So that's one of the steps you have to do if you wanted to um, import your database. But you don't have to do that anymore, which is pretty neat. So I'm going to pick every table. I do not pick queries. There's a good reason for that. Most of the time, I would say in a project, when I do a conversion project, most of the queries are fine. They were fine, but some are just slow. So I'd rather not populate the SQL Server with all those views that it's going to do. Because what you do, if you pick all these queries, it's just going to populate your SQL Server database with views. And then some of these uh, queries may not work uh, because they're referencing the internal function or using temp bars, for example, as a criteria. It'll just fail the conversion. So it's a pain to pick all the queries and then have to see which ones don't convert. Uh, rather than do that, I'll just, I'll just convert them manually later. All right. So this is my local SQL Server. Uh, I'm using Windows Authentication. And I'm going to talk about when you install SQL Server, we're going to talk about the security surface and how to configure it uh, later on in the class tonight. But let's go ahead and click on Next. Now, notice you have this little link tables here. Now, if you do this link tables, what's going to happen is it's going to link your tables back to the SQL Server automatically. And it's going to back up your local tables to another um, copy of the database. I'll show you that um, once it's done. Usually, I don't do that. Usually, I use DSL list connections. I use uh, code to connect my tables. And I don't bother with this link tables. But if you want to make your life easier, you can just do that. All right. So uh, I made a mistake here. So I'm going to cancel here. And I'm going to see if I can start again. Because what I wanted to do was... I wanted to create a new access database and it's picked up the last one. So that's something you want to be sure you don't do. So I'm going to uh, click on here again and restart this conversion. So I want to convert, load, and migrate. So if you don't use the wizard, that's what you want first time around, convert, load, and migrate. Doggone it, I did it anyway. But uh, there was a step there when it connects to SQL Server, asks you for a database name. Yeah, and don't do what I do, just click on next because then it's going to overwrite your uh, prior database. Here is where it says, oh, okay, well, these over here, and you want to overwrite this. I'm going to cancel this again and cancel that. And let's just restart this real quick. We didn't lose much time. No, say no, say. All right. Okay. Again, with Gusto. All right, so this is SQL Server Migration 5, so I'm going to call this SQL Academy. Academy, try number two. SQL Server 19, click on Next. Add my database. I just created this with the Northwind database. Click on Next. And it's reading the database down here, Microsoft Access Objects and Tables. So obviously, if you have a very large database, it's going to take longer, but this one went right through it. And by default, it just picks tables. And now I'm going to click on Next. 
And now here is where I should have done is to select the right database. So I'm going to say SQL Academy, Academy Try 2. And notice that the encrypt connection is checked by default, which is what you always want to do. But keep in mind that uh, you can migrate to Azure with this tool, which is great. And I didn't show you that part, but I'll show it to you in a second. But when you use Azure, Azure will reject any connections that are not encrypted. So keep that in mind. And that's a selling point I have with uh, new customers. I say, hey, we, uh, we enforce encryption. So it'll get denied if you don't do it. Well, you know, yeah, it'll get denied regardless, right? But make it sound like, hey, we know we're enforcing encryption and it's going to get denied. And they're like, oh, yeah, great one. Thanks. That sounds good. That looks good. That sounds good. <laughs> a little used car salesman technique there. So obviously, this is the first time I connect. It's going to ask me to create the database. This is assuming that you have the rights to add the database. It's my server, so I do have the rights. I'm going to say yes. If you're doing this with, and I'm going to click on link tables. If you're doing this on a network, your client's network, you may be at the uh, at the mercy of the DBA, right? He's the one that's going to be doing this for you. So usually, what I do is I convert it locally. And then I just give them a backpack file and they upload it to the server. All right, so here we got to the point where notice that these uh, tables are not found. Yeah, they're not found because we just created the database. I'm going to click on OK. It's going to go through that. All right, while it's doing that, it's going to take a little bit. A couple things. When you go and install SQL Server Express, now raise your hand if you already saw SQL Server Express before. Let me know in the comments. But um, when you do that, it uh, really is a, uh, a comment on you to open up the security because it installs by default as stringent as possible. So nobody can connect to it. It's uh, closed up like a clamp. So you need to open it up. And they call that, and you'll see the, uh, the SQL Server configuration surface or the surface of the server. It's a fancy term uh, for security. All right, so it did the uh, tables, right, created tables. Now it's ready to link back, and it's asked me what kind of authentication I want to use linking the table. So I'm going to say Windows Authentication. I'm going to click on Connect. And you get this little dialog. Now, I already told you I wanted Windows Authentication, but for some reason, you have to click this Use Trusted Connection, and I leave the server spin out of it, and I click on OK. And now it's going to create the backups of the local tables and replace them with link tables. Now, the way you configure SQL Server Surface Configuration is that using the SQL Server Configuration um, tool. So you see Configuration Manager, which for some reason is not installed on my. Let me just check something here. SQL Server Studio Installation Center Profile. Use SQL Server. Something, what am I missing here? SQL Server Management Studio. That's not it. Let's see, let's do this. Configuration. Configuration. No, I'm not getting it. And uh, I installed it on this. So I should, when you can install it, it should be there automatically. Uh, this is what I get from not practicing this part of the presentation. I practice everything else. Migration, everything else, not this. Let me see. This is 2017. I got 2018, 2019, so I know it's not that. Mm, that's too bad. I'm going to do this. We'll do this. We'll cover this in the next month at the uh, Advanced SQL Server Microsoft Access class. And uh, we can discuss there how to do that. All right. So um, this is the ideal condition, right? You have a local SQL Server Express. You have um, you own the server. You own the security. But, you know, things in the real world are not as hunky-dory. So um, when you go through this process at a client site, you may not have DB owner privileges. You may not have a security privilege to create a database on that server. Now, usually what I do is I talk to the IT department, and I tell them, look, I, I'm straight up with them. I says, look, why don't you go ahead and create the database for me? Make me DB owner. And it's my little corner of your SQL server, and that way I don't have to call you when I create tables. I don't have to call you every time I an index. I don't have to call you every time I have to modify a table. I have to call you every time I do a uh, uh, run a script, right? I just take care of it. 
usually when it's a starting from scratch, I've never had anybody say no. It was like, okay, cool, yeah, here's the database. I made a DB owner, go at it. So what they do is they create a network account for me on their network, and they told me, point me to the right server, and then they create the database for me, and they make me DB owner, and that's it. Otherwise, um, I have to uh, work with the uh, DBA and uh, walk him through either this process, or I get a copy of their database. Now, there's a problem with that because obviously I don't want to have a client's data on my network. We try to avoid that, right? It's a big no-no. And so what we do is we uh, either ask them to obfuscate the data. There are several tools that you can use to mix up the data. So we can still get their access database, but uh, the data is all mixed up. Or, um, or um, yeah, or um, we, we they just give us the raw data and we just end up having the copy of their data. And usually small businesses, they don't have a problem with that unless there's data that's sensitive and they're like social security numbers, credit cards, addresses of customers, so forth. Some businesses just don't care and I'm, I make a point not taking their data. All right, when you do this, uh, notice that we got six errors, 240, 640, 245 more. So let's take a look at these errors. All right, so a uh, couple things. In Access, um, you can create a yes, no field. And that yes, no field in Access is, uh, is, has no default. Or you can default to the yes, or you can default to no, those three conditions. There is a known bug with SQL Server where, and SQL Server is not called yes, no, it's called bit field. And the values are 0 and 1, right? So in Access, it's, if, you know, if you're an Access developer, you know it's 0 and 1. With SQL Server, you know it's 0 minus 1. By the way, I got my new Access MVP pen here. I'm showing that off for 29, for 2020. Um, so I've been playing with that. It's like a magnetic pen. When I, when I used to visit customers, I had this shirt, the Microsoft Access shirt. I don't know if you can see that there. It's Microsoft Access logo. And then uh, with my pin. But um, so when you migrate this, this wizard is smart enough to make sure the default value is zero. So by default, all your bit fields are going to be negative or false. Uh, column last name, right? Now, this is something that really irks me. This is Microsoft's database. And they're using spaces in their field names. Come on, man. Really? So uh, that's what that <laughs> is. So, yeah. Um, uh, this is another one, right? The attachment data type is not supported in SQL Server. This is what people use to uh, take photos and upload it to an Access Database document. They so use the attachment data type. That is not supported. Instead, there's a block field, a blob field that you can use in SQL Server to store that, that kind of metadata. We usually create a, a TBL documents. It's a document storage system that we develop and access with SQL Server. And uh, basically what that does is you create a documents table. You specify one that fields as blob and you give it a document ID as self-incremented. And then you use a code to upload documents to SQL Server from access. So we have all that mechanics and usually we, we, we demo that to new customers. They just love the technology. And we just drop it into their access project. This is a big one, right? We need to make sure that every table has what uh, is called a timestamp, which uh, is a, uh, in the past, it's been called world version and uh, timestamp is a little, it's all the same thing. For some reason, this did not get a timestamp attached to it. Uh, I'll show you that in a second, how that looks. So I'm gonna click on close and you can get the report if you want to. Now I'll go ahead and show you here the report. And it's pretty comprehensive, as you can imagine. And, uh, you know, you have warnings, you got errors, you got info. So you want to save this report if you want to really go through it. All right. Now, uh, notice that 98.5% uh, of your um, uh, columns uh, got converted, 96%. You want to strive, obviously, for 100%, right? If it's not 100%, then you're not doing your job. You need to address the issues and do the conversion again a second time. So you remove the attachment field. You you, you probably uh, back it up to a separate uh, Microsoft Access file, and then remove the attachment field. And then we did modify design the database. So you have a documents table and the orders table, maybe, whatever the other table the attachment field is. 
And uh, you do those issues, you fix those issues first, and then you migrate to SQL Server. Going back to my first lesson, fix your problems and access first before you migrate. So I'm going to close that. I'm going to close this. And now I'm going to launch the database. But before I do, I'm going to save this. And there's a reason I'm saving this. And now I want to make sure I include the metadata, metadata for the database. I'm going to click on Save. Great. Now, through the life of a project, right? So say, for example, they hire you to do one of these projects. We get hired all the time. Through the life cycle of converting an access database to SQL Server, there's going to be multiple stages where you're going to need to upload this data over and over again. So the first time you create the database, right, and you migrate the data. Well, as soon as they give you that file in a few days, it's stale, right, because data is constantly evolving at companies. So you have to go through the weeks of development and you've, and you've gotten your database ready, uh, your X front end with your SQL Server backend ready, and you're ready to do alpha testing with the client, then you have to upload the data again. So I'm going to show you how to do that in a minute. But first, I want to make a point of that by closing this, going into the access database that I just converted. I'm going to pick this here. I'm going to log in. And voila, this is now converted to SQL Server. Now, I'm going to show you a couple things. Number one, I almost never see these tables. These are the backups I mentioned. Remember I told you if you link back, it's going to back up the table. So these are your backups of all the assistant tables. So, for example, here, if I go to the employee table, which is where A, B, C, D, E, F. Let me go up here. Employees. Here we go, employees. I go to the employees table, and then I come in here, and it says the equivalent is SSMA employees local. So if I double click, I get to see my rows, right? I just uploaded. So that's what those tables are. You can delete those if you don't need them. Most likely you don't need them because before you did this conversion, you backed it up, right? You did back up the file before you went through in there and used it, right? So you have a backup of that, you're like, okay, yeah, I don't need it. I'll delete them. Now this is the uh, SQL Server version. Let me double check these at SQL Server version. So now I'm going to add a new record, right? So this is, for example, I'm, gonna, uh, it's, I'm doing the alpha version or the beta version, and they hand me a new data file. It says, hey, this is our latest file before we do beta testing. Can you upload to the server so we know how to do it? All right, so I'm going to go ahead here. I'm going to change this. So I'm going to add a new record. Now there's a shortcut key to copy the value of the field before that. This control apostrophe. So here I'm going to say duck as the last name, Daffy, first name. It's Staffy at Disney.com is the email. And he's a sales rep. And that's his phone number and so forth. So I'm just going to copy the exact same record except for the name. All right. Fluent in French. All right. Actually, you know what? It's just, he is actually fluent in duck. French and duck. Okay. So I got this date record there. I'm going to now close the access database. And I'm going to upload it again. But before I upload it, I want to show you something. So I'm going to go into SQL Server Migration Assistant. I'm going to right-click on my database. I'm going to make SQL Server Manager Studio. I'm going to right-click on my database, refresh it. So you can see the new database I just created. Here it is, SQL Server Academy. Try it too. I'm going to go to my tables and my employees, right? Uh, employees. I'm going to go select top 1,000 rows, and you should see nine records, not 10 records. There they are, right? Oh, Daffy Duck, there it is. This could have, yeah, it's already, dark on it, it's linked. That's why it's refreshed. I didn't want to do that. So how do I, oh, let me delete this. I need to go back to the access original table and then do that. So let me do that now. I can't delete from here. So I'm gonna go in. I'm gonna go into access. I didn't save a copy of it, so now I gotta do it again. So I'll go to Dorfwin database again. Same structure. I'm gonna call it uh, alpha version. Alpha version. And I'm actually gonna launch that version I had before. And I'm gonna delete that Daffy Duck reference I had in there. So you can see how it works. So I'm going to do that. So I'm going to delete this one from the server. So now it's gone from the server. If I go back into the server. Let 
Let me click on enable content. And I'm going to databases, user academy try two, tables, employees. And I'm going to select top 1,000 rows. And it's not there. So Daffy Duck is there. So I go back to 99 records again. Perfect. So I don't have to close this. I'll just minimize this. Well, it might get a lock. So let me just, it might lock. So let me just close that table. Otherwise, it might get a lock of <laughs> migration. All right. So I went ahead and I got this one, the alpha version. Now I'm going to go into employees. Notice that. Uh, let's see, customers and employees, employees, there we go. When I go into the employee list, no, you know what, I'm gonna change this to object type and tables. All right, so when I go into employees, Daffy Duck's not there, so I'm gonna create it real quick. Daffy, actually it's Daffy, Daffy Duck. And Daffy uh, at Disney. And there's a point to this. I'll show you in a second what it is, what I'm trying to make here. I'll just copy these fields. All right. But now I have this. So I have a fresh copy of the database with one new record. Okay, great. Now I bring up the project I had, SQL Server Migration Assistant, which I had saved, right, with the metadata. So I'm going to close, close this. Go to my file menu, recent projects. And SQL Server try try get me try to. Now uh, that database is no longer there, right? So I'm gonna remove this database and I'm gonna add another database. Let's see how I I need to add a database. And alpha version. Okay, great. And uh, let's see, it's going to read the tables from the access database. That's why access has to be closed. Otherwise, you might get a uh, you might get a lock on there, and I want all my tables. I don't know which tables, right? They might be data across. Who knows what tables? So I'm gonna come down here, and I'm gonna pick the database I'm gonna migrate to. SQL Server Academy Try Two, which is already selected. Schemas, and then the DBL schema. It defaults into DBL. I'm not gonna get into schemas. That's an advanced class. All right. Now, if I right click here. In my alpha version, this time I only want to migrate data. Now remember, I added the Daffy Duck to that table, so I'm going to click on Connect. So what it's going to do is it's going to erase all the data in SQL Server. So it's not comparing. I don't want you to, make, I don't want you to have this misconception where, oh, it's going to see which tables have new records, achieve fields. No. It's going to delete everything. And it's going to import it again. Right? And that's that's okay because we're in alpha version, beta version. Obviously, if I'm production database, I wouldn't do that. So I'm going to hit continue. It's going through the migration. I deleted the records. It's going through the migration. I'm seeing 100%, which is absolutely outstanding. All right, that's what you want to see, 100%. Now, in my employee, I got my 10 records. See that? I know that the AFI doc is included there. So I'll close this. And now it's done. So I actually do this a lot. And it's going to ask me to save for the alpha version. I'll say yes. I do this a lot. Uh, every project I use this tool. I'm constantly using this tool throughout the project because sometimes, you know, when you tell a customer, "Hey, let's do this beta test," it's not just one beta test. It was a fairly complex database. You're gonna have to provide them with uh, you're gonna have to provide them with uh, uh, various versions of beta, and they might be far, weeks apart, right? So we will do one beta. They report a lot of bugs. I, mean, I corrected them, so two weeks later, I'm ready for another beta again. They ask me to refresh the data. Because they want to be able to go into the old system and have the new system right there and compare how it behaves. And it's always good that you have the latest data in the new version of SQL Server so that they compare apples to apples. You can run a report in the old version and run a report the new one, and they can see that the reports match, right? Or they can bring up a record in the old version and bring up another record in the new version. So usually what they have is both versions there. They're testing on the new version versus old, and they're comparing speed. They're comparing reliability. They're comparing... the if there's any bug running the feature, all that. Uh, yeah, somebody asked in the chat there about my first one. Uh, Susan, I don't know if you had a chance to convert the 
uh, the first video training Susan does our videos in behind on the class. Okay. Did you have just to do the intro class? Okay, Crystal's working on that one. It should be ready oh, shortly. Yeah. Now we do this every year, to be honest. We start our season in September, and every season we start with introduction, and then the second month is a medium, and then the third one is advanced. So you can go to prior year's classes to see. It changed a little bit, really, as information changes. I'm hoping that they get better over the years, like a fine wine, but we'll see. So Leslie, you can you can go look at that, but keep in mind we have a channel, and Susan's going to post a link to our channel on YouTube, and you can subscribe, which I really appreciate. If you, all of you guys can subscribe for me, that would be great. I, I would love to see the subscription count go up on that channel. Please click subscribe. Please like the video if you liked it. Uh, Susan did a video, wonderful video, how to convert to 64-bit app uh, access from 32-bit, and it's got a ton of views. How many views have you had on that video last time you checked? Quite a few. It's been a while since I checked it, actually. I'll have a look. Yeah, she was uh, quite impressed with herself. She said, oh, one, I've got all these views on my video. So that's great, right? We love seeing that, right? So uh, if you like a class, please, I mean, if you like a video, please do that. And then there's Access Lunchtime, there's Access uh, Latino, and there's Access España, and there's Access Eastern Time. And we're actually looking to open Access in the Pacific, somebody who uh, opens open a chapter in California for those folks out there. Because in California, it's 8.30 Chicago time, and I just can't afford to do that that late, right? 6.30 for California time, 8.30 Chicago. So if you can find a chapter coordinator in California, we'll need to step up and do these classes. That would be great. Do these uh, sessions. That would be great. All right. Now, having said all that regarding the SQL Server Migration Assistant, and by the way, we have the worldwide authority on SQL Server Migration Assistant tonight in this class. Klaus, please say hi. Mm. That's the way he says hi. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I can't pronounce his last name. I'll try. I know I'm a murderer. So it's uh, Oberdachhoff. <laughs> Did I do that? Say that right, Klaus? He's a little shy. All right. Now, I started with SQL Server Migration Assistant, and one of the things I want you to look out for is a couple of things. Number one, before you use the wizard, and the wizard is great. I use it all the time. But uh, when you first saw, install SQL Server Migration Assistant, you want to go into Tools and Global Settings. Uh, no, that's not it. When you want to go into Tools and Default Project Settings. Now, remember how I told you last time that uh, uh, last time I see migration type, so 2019. Remember I told you last time how it's smart enough to add the timestamp and so you can change those parameters here. Now, one of the things I wanted you to look up for is type mapping. All right, so in SQL and Access, the source type is yes, no, right? SQL Server is the bit field. So let's look at that. Yes, no. Let's see if I can find it here. This is Boolean, all right, so it's not yes, no, and it's good. Now, if I go into edit here, I got, I can change this if I wanted to. Now, uh, Armin Stein, who is a uh, Mother Access MVP, he does not like using bit fields. He uses another methodology. He's written a blog post about that. Uh, I like to use bit fields, so, but you can actually change this to another target type if you want to do that. You can also add your own uh, type. I've never had to do that. And uh, one of the things that I want you to also look out for is var and var char. All right. And that's this one. So I always end up doing this. I always come in here in var char, click on edit, and change it from text to var char. Now, in var char, if you're a uh, international company, and you've got, uh, you know, the Spanish language has more characters in the alphabet, Greek language. Those uh, languages outside of English require more memory. And that's why you want to use MVARCHAR in those instances. Otherwise, you want to just use VARCHAR, and that will uh, make it uh, a lot more, uh, it will save space on the SQL Server. Back in the old days, this meant a lot of difference. And, you know, not that you're going to see much difference on X database. Because let's face it, you're not worried, you're not dealing with terabytes of data because it's access, right? The most of the B is 
two gigabytes at the most of data. And by the way, if you take a two gigabyte access database and you migrate to SQL Server, it's going to end up being like 600 megabytes. So it's stored much more efficiently in SQL Server than Access would. But because mm -hmm. of the fact that, uh, you know, when they do, when they say, oh, it takes more memory, they're probably looking at data warehouses with millions and trillions of raw data. Yeah, it's going to take up more space if you're using bar char. Access, that's debatable, but I still do it. So I replaced that one. And now when I click on OK, the next time I do my project, it's going to be able to do that uh, without a problem. September 2019 is also SQL Server kind of point one if you want to watch that. Is it live, uh, Susan, already? But that's from last year. Last, oh, last year, year, the yeah. one you yeah, did last you. year, yeah. Okay. The, the September for this year is still being processed, but it should be available okay. shortly. All right. Uh, Susan does make a good point, and this is daytime, too. And by the way, we need to talk about... People, we need to have a serious discussion about a bug that came out last week. Um, uh, this reminds me. But let's go ahead and change this one as well. And what Susan accurately points out is uh, we want to change this to daytime instead of daytime, too. So it wasn't me, it was James. Oh, James, okay. James, you can do that. Uh, we still use daytime, too, I believe, right, Susan? 2.0, two, two uh, and then the zero in the parenthesis. I think we haven't had problems with that. Yes. Great uh, time, time too. The, the, the issue, the bug lately with access is the new date time extended that they have in access. Yes, which has been pulled, by the way. That update was pulled. It was released to the wild. And then they realized it was still not ready for prime time and they pulled it. So uh, you, you can follow James' recommendation, right? Date and date time. Uh, Otherwise, you need to uh, do this daytime too if you want. I'm going to see if I can find Ben's recommendation. He did tell me why we use daytime too instead of ordinary daytime. So I'll look if I can find that and post Thank that you. here. Now, when you query dates in SQL Server, and this has happened to everybody <laughs> who's migrated to SQL Server, right? Everybody, even the pros. Um, the first time you do a query, you realize you're missing some records. You're like, oh my gosh, I did between January 1st, 2020 and January 1st to, to uh, January 31st, 2020. And I'm missing like five or six records. Well, it turns out that you have to add the time, right? So it's January 1st, midnight to January 1st, to January 31st, 1159 p.m. And that will make sure you have all your records there. You know what? I we don't we don't have any problems with the daytime too, but we're usually dealing with Office 365. David, David has some questions. I'm reading the chat, so if you want to look in the chat for all these comments, guys, you can do this. I really don't have a problem with uh, daytime too, but again, again, we're usually dealing 90% of our projects with Office 365. It's been really, uh, uh, I I mean, lately I haven't found any client who has not been using Office 365. Most of people. Love that value proposition. And actually, I was meeting with Microsoft today, with the Microsoft team today. As an MVP, we have these periodic meetings. And uh, one of the things I mentioned was the value proposition of Office 365. You know, the old days, several years ago, if you wanted to, if you had 20 employees and you wanted them all to have access, you would go and buy at Office Depot or Best Buy 20 licenses of Office, Office uh, 2010 or Office 2000 and uh, and spend three hundred dollars a pop. It was not cheap. It still is not cheap. You, you can still do that, but most people have gone to Office 365 model where you pay by the month, um, twelve dollars or nine dollars based on the versa version of the system you have. But you get so much more with Office 365, right? That you get the ability to run Office. You get five licenses per person, so I can install it on my laptop, my workstation at home, my kids' computer. My uh, iPad and my cell phone, that's five licenses. And now, obviously, if I'm running in my cell phone, I'm not going to get access. But I get access to my email. I can open PowerPoint and other files on my cell phone. And my iPad, on my cell phone here, my uh, iPhone. And uh, open Excel spreadsheets and so forth. But you also include Team, includes Team, which is great. Another communication platform that's really uh, being upgraded. 
daytime two is causing some issues with code queries. We'll change the daytime two later. Okay, James, no, no worries. David, I still remember going into the server room hunting through stacks of installation CDs. Yeah, remember that CD, David, where it was uh, that subscription CD that called included all the Microsoft software and it had the, the, the license on it, and it was just amazing to have that CD. Yeah, the MSDN subscription. Now, fun fact. Uh, the reason why you want to become an Access MVP, I'm just saying, we you get a free MSDN subscription. So I can download from the web any version of Windows, any version of Office, SQL Server, Enterprise, SQL Server. Of course, it's supposed to be for personal use. Personal use. I get I get 10 licenses of Office. And I get, I mean, it's just amazing what they give you as an MVP. And they also give me $100 a month credit in Azure. Ah, the secret sauce. I actually wrote a blog post on how to how I became MVP. I encourage you to go to my blog at accessexperts.com forward slash blog and look through the articles there. And yes. there's one recently where I talked about I just became an MVP and this is how I did it. Let's take a look at that. Spoiler alert, if you become a press chapter president of Access User Groups, that helps a lot. So if, you're, if you live in California, please shoot me a line if you're interested in becoming an Access User Group Chapter President. Look, uh, we need to talk about what just happened uh, last week. Last week, the uh, Access team released an update to the current channel. Uh, it was called 2019 Update. And folks who were using the current channel in Office 365. So just so you know, Office 365 comes in different flavors. There's the uh, enterprise channel, there's a semi-annual channel, there's a current channel, there's an Office Insider channel. And um, so if you want the bleeding edge of Office with the latest features up to the date, you want the current channel. If you want if you to be more risque and see stuff that's in preview mode, you go to Office Insider. Everybody, anybody can go to Office Insider. And actually, you guessed it, I have a blog post on how to become an Office Insider. So take a look at that. What I don't recommend, kids, is that you become an Office Insider your production machine. So what I recommend in that case is you use Hyper-V, you create a virtual machine, you get yourself a license of Windows 10, and then you get yourself a license of Office 365, and then that license is what you go on Office Insider. Because I'm an Access MVP, I get Windows 10 licenses. I can do Hyper-V, and I can do all that. Otherwise, you have to spend for all that. So I'm not sure if it's worth your while to do all that, just so you can see that. So Susan just found some information. Read through that, James. What do you think what you just posted there? Uh, Susan, do you have a blog post with that's talking about? Do you have a the link to the blog post where you talk about that? Uh, the... Sorry, I was focusing on the date time. The one for the bug recently and reverting back to the earlier version? No, you just pasted this date time to information. Is that from? Oh, post? no, no, no. No, that was an internal conversation with Ben. Okay. Can you hit him <coughs> up and tell him that would be a nice blog post? He has these great uh, discussions. We have these great discussions around the cooler here. That T impact. We use Slack. So we're migrating to Teams, and we have a general channel and a dev channel, and all the devs go to come together to talk to that technical stuff, which the accounting person can kind of care for. So that's why we have a dev channel. And uh, so uh, Susan and uh, Ben and the other developers at IT Impact, they go through this. All right, so going back to my discussion. Uh, we got bit really bad uh, several months ago with a bug that came out in the current channel. I mean, it was bad. We had several clients that were down. And uh, uh, we implemented the policy, it says no more. We're gonna make sure every customer is on the semi ammo channel. And so um, we went through that whole process. We sent out an emergency email. You need to revert back <laughs> and do this and do that. And then we told them, look, don't be on the current channel. You want to be on the semi annual channel, which is every six months you get new features. And by then, it's been debugged and proofed, and everything is ready to go. It's much more stable, right? But when this latest 2019 fiasco happened, version 2019, not the year 2019, 
Uh, none of our clients got affected except one had recently we uh, recently uh, acquired who did have this issue. And I don't know if that was yours, Susan. Was that your customer? I can't remember. It was. Okay. And so uh, one of the things that we're going to do is uh, our boarding process with your customers to make sure uh, that one of the first things we do is make sure they're on the semi-annual channel. And so we didn't we didn't email anybody. We just said, no, let's not email anybody. Let's see if anybody calls. One did. <laughs> Turned out to be students. And uh, they're uh, 2009, not 2019. 2009. Susan just put a, uh, a blog on there. And Susan, you also created a blog post on how to migrate to back to a prior version, right? That's, yeah, Ben included that in the same blog. Okay. So they're both okay. there together. You know, Kent, I don't use the runtime on purpose. I tell customers we can use runtime, but, uh, I mean, and this is, can be a little lengthy chat, but bottom line, runtime is not the same thing as a full access version, obviously, I want access, Microsoft wants you to buy the full access version. A good example is that spell check. The runtime does not have any spell check capabilities. So we're way around that, but uh, I just don't like dealing with it because I usually tell a customer, look, I understand why you're doing runtime. You want to save money. Uh, and I get it, but uh, keep in mind that it's going to cost you more because now we have to run tests on the production version, which is not runtime. And then we also need to do another round of tests uh, part of the, on the runtime version. So it just makes it more money and usually the cost difference, it's just not worth it what you're saving for the office. So that's how I, that's my way of making sure the clients don't uh, don't have to uh, use one time. But yeah, I mean, uh, I, because I don't use runtime, I don't know if you got affected or not. On there, were you affected, Kent? The user runtime to further lock the Apple down as well as compile to ACC. Okay. But you can compile to ACC. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're using runtime, right? Okay. Well, runtime. Okay. Yeah. Especially if you're selling a product, you know, you want to give them the ACCDE to protect your code. That's great. All right. Um, recently, I had a, uh, a, I was reading through some uh, form and somebody had um, acquired a client that had the ACCD version and didn't have the original source code. There is a, um, there is a service out there that will uh, do that for you. They will recover the code for you. So if you ever come across that situation where you have a customer who has ACCD and they lost the original code, source code, mm -hmm. this particular company can do that. And I can't remember the name of the company. Does anybody Perfect. remember? I can't do this. Anybody? Everybody remember? I can't remember. I think it's the same guy who does VB Watchdog. But anyway, he wants you to have when you go talk to him. He is not a shady character at all. He will actually require that you prove that this is your software before he'll he'll give you that service of giving the code back. So, so you gotta be careful with ACCD. I know why you do it, and there's only one guy in the world that I know who converts ACCD back to code, but it's not necessarily foolproof. All right, so uh, when it comes to uh, Migration Assistant, wonderful tool, Use, save it so you can migrate throughout the beta process. And then the last thing you want to do is migrate. You, you went through the beta process, now you're ready to roll out the product, right? So you went through this whole process and you did multiple rounds of beta. You're ready to do one final migration to SQL Server. Now, keep in mind, there is a special use case where after you've uploaded these tables to SQL Server, you modify the table design. You have fields somewhere, you add uh, your tables, so you got to be careful about that. It may not be straightforward as to doing this. So that's why I always fix the field names and the table names before I create the SQL Server database. database. And then every time they give you a new vial, it's going to have the wrong field names again and the wrong table names. So it's, you know, it does become a hassle sometimes. It's not that straightforward as I demonstrated tonight. But when you're ready to roll out, there's two things you need to be aware of. Number one, you need an emergency plan in case it goes wrong, something goes wrong. And number two, you want to avoid interruptions to your customers, right? So when we have when people call us up and they ask us to migrate their data SQL server, it's a mission critical app. 
you know, they're not just calling us up to see how it looks or tasks because it costs thousands of dollars. We're not cheap. We're not the best. We're not the cheap. We're not the cheapest. We are the best is why I like to tell customers. And so uh, usually what we do is we sit down with the customer and we, we plan a rollout plan. And that usually entails probably Friday afternoon. They stop using the access database if they can. Sometimes they can't do even do that. Sometimes we have to work on a Saturday morning to convert them over. But usually we, we, we convince them to cut off a Saturday afternoon, I mean Friday afternoon. We migrate the data with SQL Server Migration Assistant to the production version. Then we do a series of tests. Now, the first test is the one that Migration Assistant shows you, which is the 100%, right? Remember how I showed you the 100% of the records got migrated over to SQL Server? The second test is to run reports on the production version and the uh, and then the, and the uh, new one, the SQL Server, make sure they match. Now, you've probably been doing that through the beta phase and shouldn't be no surprise to you guys if you're ready to go out to production. But, you know, you want to do this one final test. And there's some additional tests you can do. So, for example, you might even open the orders table and data data and table view uh, and add a subtotal, create a total for all dollars and make sure that matches the total dollars in the access version. So there's a series of tests that you can do, but basically the three of them are the more records migrated, same number of records you have in access, the total dollars or total amount of records match in SQL Server access, and uh, reports, they work, right? Okay, you did all that. You did it Friday afternoon. Everybody went to the bar afterwards. This was pre-pandemic, by the way. Everybody went to the bar afterwards. I paid the first round. It says, first round, not me. Let's go. Woohoo! We're live. <laughs> and uh, great. And then come Monday morning, it all goes to hell in a handbasket. For whatever reason. Maybe uh, when you were doing beta testing, you were testing with five people. And then Monday morning, you had 100 people on there. And that has happened to me. It went from five people to beta testing to 100 people using the system, and it crashed and burned. Couldn't handle it. The server wasn't adequate enough. The network wasn't fast enough for whatever reason, right? So in those cases, come Monday morning, you have two options. You can either, A, fix the problems that uh, correct the issues and stay on SQL Server, or B, revert back to Microsoft Access. Now, if you're going to revert back to Microsoft Access, you need to make sure you do that right away. You don't want to wait two weeks and then realize, you know, this is definitely no good. We're going back to access now because in two weeks of data that's been updated to SQL Server, now you have to downgrade that to access. That's a pain in the butt. How are you going to downgrade that back to access? Are you going to do data entry again access? Are you going to take it from – there's a tool to go from access to SQL Server. There is no tool to go from SQL Server to access, right? You would have to do update insert queries and access, and that's going to take a long time. Try to uh, try to insert 100,000 records into an access table from SQL Server. You can go get yourself a coffee or a beer at this time of night, come back, and it's still not done. So uh, when you go live, right, always have a backup plan, always test, and you'll be fine, right? And uh, prepare the customer. Say, look, we've done beta testing. It's worked fine, but keep in mind, these things can happen. Number one, at the top of the list, it hasn't been stress tested. You only have five beta users. Now you're going to 100. Do I want, I wish I can do stress testing 100 users? Yes, I'd love to in beta, but sometimes that's not possible. They're not going to stop the whole company for several hours. So everybody, get on the new version. First, I have to install the new version of everybody's PC. And they may not have, they may have, be, have be running an older version of Windows, Windows 7, with Office 2000. Who knows what they have on there? They don't have Windows 10. That's another thing lately I've been seeing, is we go from Office well, Windows 7 to Office 2000 or 2010. They want to go Windows 10, Office 365. Which, by the way, Office 365 is not the same thing as Office 2019 or 2020. Office 365 is its own animal. If you will go to a store and buy Office, you'll see Office 2019. That's not the same version of Office 365. Just want to make throw that out there. So, um, anybody got a question on that? Well, I can hear somebody was going to say a question. Just stop me if you have a question. But anyway, what was I? Oh, yes. And so, you know, they're going to Windows 10. So what happens is we, when that's that kind of a rollout, on a Friday afternoon, we cut off, or Saturday morning, 
Yeah, you have desktop switching, right? So they prepared 100 desktops for Windows 10, and they swap them out. So now everybody has a new machine come Monday morning. They have a new office, and it's all hands on deck. Everybody in IT, and people might be maybe having problems with their email because the first time they use an email and it didn't come over, the desktop icons were missing. All kinds of stuff that can happen. And this has all happened to me. I've been through all. I've been through that grinder. It's a lot of fun. But, uh, you know, and I've, and I've been there Saturday night, Sunday night, trying to resolve issues. I went live Friday. Didn't work. You got to correct some issues. Then the customer and I had to show up on Saturday. Had to show up on Sunday. And then Sunday we had to decide, okay, is it working? Great. Are we going live Monday? Yes. Are we going live Monday? No. Yes, it's working, but we need to test it more one. Okay, get it. I get it. So Monday, the employees were thinking they were going to come and see the new version. They weren't. They wait another week to do the rollout. So it goes on and on when it comes to enterprise upgrades of Access and SQL Server, right? Uh, mark my words. You want to manage the process and not react, right? Always one of my favorite sayings. Manage and not react. If you're reacting, you're behind the ball. You're not doing your client and you just, you're doing the client your client disservice. So it's important that you manage this process. Take it by the bullhorns and get it done. Great. So that's it for me. What questions you may have? Any questions, comments? Did you go? Do you guys go? Went to my channel uh, and uh, subscribe. I hope you did. So you can put the link in the comments there. Was you, you have any questions? Did you like uh, the session? By the way, it was nice. Yeah. Thank you. I think that was Klaus. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. All right. Any questions before we go? Leslie, did you like it? All right. Thumbs up from Leslie. Is this your <laughs> first time? No? Okay. All right. Matt says thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. Wait a second. Leslie's playing on her headset. Stand by, people. Yes. <laughs> I, I'm just, uh, it, it's hard for me to get in um, sometimes and uh, um, stay the whole time because I always have something going on. And then there are times when I've come and I it was just way above my head. But this was really good because I, I, right now what I'm doing is we have a situation where we've lost our VPN and so we and we have this database and we have multiple users on a file server and they want the file server to go away and so we have to find another option and i was looking at sharepoint oh, and, and SharePoint. it looks like to me that that's kind of a disaster yes i found that you can put uh you could you can actually put a back end on like OneDrive, but no, huh? Oh, okay. No. Good to know. All right, well I'll I'll go forward with trying to learn this then. And do Yeah, this. so what you want to do is um are you what you want to do is use Azure SQL Service, right? Now if you've never used Azure before, it's gonna be a challenge because not only uh, you migrated to SQL Server for the first time, you've never done it, but now you're dealing with latencies involved, right? Because it's not the same thing as a file server on your local network. Now there's a latency, and there, that's a whole different class, which I, I can probably teach in December how to migrate to Azure. But I have videos on that, so look at the channel. Did we take class that you have? Look at the so channel. So what is the channel? So I have here, I have uh, videos. So accessusersgroup.org, but that's not your No, that's uh, No, let me get you the uh, channel. So, yeah. Yeah, here it is. Found it. So here it is. That's okay. the channel. And there, let me see if I can find that... Uh, Azure class. Oh, let me see. Uh, subscribe. Let's see. Uh, Azure access user groups. Access user groups. You know, I don't know how to search one in my own channel. Can you believe that? Oh, here it is. There's a search right there. Okay, Azure. Here, let me share my screen. 
All right. Using, uh, I, I clicked on here and then I did this Azure here. This is in Spanish, so I don't recommend that one. <laughs> uh, let's see. Using VBA to manage data and access web app. No, nope, that's not it either. Yeah, some of those look like they're in Spanish or something. Yeah, yeah from my <laughs> Spanish groups. <laughs> Performance doing uh, VP Summit Super Server. Hmm. The replication and half or anywhere. See, mine doesn't. Uh, when I pull up, let's see, I pulled up that one link. It doesn't show that. But it does show accessusergroups.org. Yeah, I pulled over front. the link I gave you, which is a YouTube channel. Yeah, okay, I, that's yeah. where I'm at. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, let me do a search for online. Oh, there's a bunch of playlists, I see. Oh, those are my playlists too. You see? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's playlists there. Yeah, you're right. Yes. I know. I never, never. I need to maybe uh, take advantage of those playlists and organize this stuff. Oh, Axis and SharePoint. Interesting. Yeah. Question. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, one of our my employees, Ben Clothier, he wrote the book on Axis and SharePoint, and you can oh. actually buy it on um, Amazon many, many moons ago. I, you know, I just don't see that access in SharePoint, you know, putting your database, your back end on um, SharePoint seems like it's not the best choice no. to me based on no, no. what no. I've been playing with it today. Yeah, no. Let's see here. I'm going to have to look for it. If you drop me, I'm going to send you my email. Okay. Jay Soto at itimpact.com. Drop me a line and then we'll, we'll find it and you can. I just can you, put it in the Oh, here. here. There we go. Okay. Yeah. And then yes. um, I'll see if I can find it. But look, um, migrating to Azure is difficult on by itself because you're dealing with a platform, Azure platform. It's, it may be hard and intimidating to, to do, and then you're dealing with that latency. And we get hired a lot to do this because we're known worldwide and not and migraine, migraine. We call it web enabling access. You're still using access, but the data is in the cloud. And uh, there are several things that you need to do uh, to make it work. How many users have your, your application has? About four, five. Oh, okay. Four okay, five. good. Is it a not for profit or? Oh, it's a community college. Okay. <laughs> so. All right. Yeah, we do disability services. And I just so so you do what you're saying is you do Azure, and I learn about Azure and then integrate the database. The I mean um, SQL with it. Yeah. So you're you're following the same thing, the SQL Server Migration Assistant, and then uh, you're applying data to Azure, but because they have that latency effect, I'll give you an example. You may have a report that runs 30 seconds in access because it's a complex report, uses a ton of queries, lots of operations. That same report in Azure, instead of 30 seconds, might be three or four minutes. So it needs to be optimized. Now, I can take that same report. I can optimize it and run it in 30 seconds or again, putting it down to 30 seconds again, but then I'm creating a store procedure in the cloud. I might be, excuse me, I might be using Fuse. I'll use ADODB. It's a lot of things that that we learned over the years, a lot of gotchas that we can do. Now, um, James, in the comments here, did mention an alternative, it looks like. James, you want to explain a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um, you know, obviously, you know, lots of options. It depends on how complex, you know, the application is. We're, we're still in the process of, of converting our uh, nonprofit management system, uh, uh, you know, over you know Azure solution and uh, yeah you can just replicate say like a, a lot of our, our customers are three to four users so and they're nonprofits so they have you know big uh, incentives from Microsoft like 3500 a year or something with Azure credits which is great um, so if, if they don't want to do the conversion and just want to move their whole infrastructure you know into Azure you know that's all doable um, and then there's no conversion but you know, you know, we're we're focusing on the uh, the agile to, Azure to SQL you know conversion using you know um, 
you know, all okay. those things. But but there are issues, and you know, still working on optimization and performance and gotchas, and like, okay, why is this taking so long? And <laughs> and so there, there's been some rewrites. But, lots of uh, gotchas, yeah, lots so of gotchas. We're uh, you know, and security, you know, issues and uh, you know, bit fields that you know should be null, etc. <laughs> it's like yeah. you, you're working on the workarounds that you had in in Axis, and then now you've got new workarounds. Um, so. Uh, you know, yeah, just you have to look at each case and say, hey, what's the best way to do it? So find a consultant, you know, and uh, have them help. If only if you only knew a guy like <laughs> me. So reach out to me if you want uh, me to put you in touch with a sales department, which is me. <laughs> and then we can talk about uh, giving you a great quote to migrate the data to uh, Azure. Well, that's very sweet, but they're not going to go for that. It's me or nothing. Ah, that's I see. That's what that's one of those deals. Yeah, you know? so it's very sweet of you, though, to give me the information that you do. So I need to learn Azure and SQL. Yes. And, and then, then when you're done learning all that and becoming great at it, give me a call with your resume. <laughs> <laughs> right, James? <laughs> James can tell you, you become much more valuable once you learn this stuff. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll see. I mean, I, I, I think I, I, I don't know. I mean, I haven't looked at Azure. The, the SQL looks like it's something I can do. I'm pretty good at Access now. I mean, I'm not yeah. as advanced as some of the people I've seen, but I teach it for a living. Okay. And, and I have for five years. Wait a second. You're attending my class and you teach access for a living? I am flattered. Well, this is not really access. This is trying to get access, a back end yes. to, of access somewhere yeah. else. Because that's what yeah. I need is I need a back end of access really, you know, in SQL. And then we can... The front end is really wonderful, if you ask me. Yeah. You know, there's we a know. lot... We yeah. know we're big fans. <laughs> yeah, so it just it makes sense, but um, yeah. the back end, um, you know, we, we we've got some issues with well, that. Sometimes, Leslie, sometimes you get a class and there's one person in there that's just a natural. I mean, they mm -hmm. soak this up and they come back with a amazing homework results and they just get it right out the bat. They're just you just you just know that they're gifted. I would love to learn about those people. <laughs> oh, if you oh you well, I'm in Colorado, so I'm kind of. That's well, okay. We all our employees work remotely from home. We got employees around oh. the world, North America, South America. I got oh. employees on three continents. Oh well, okay. I'll keep that in mind because yeah. um, we do. I do have really some really good students sometimes. Yes. So, yeah, and, we want to talk to them. Okay. Good to know. Thank good you. Know. Thank you very much. Especially Thanks if they have time. a career and they know accounting already or they know engineering, they took up access as a hobby or they're just going through a transition like they have a lot of business experience, I definitely want to talk to them then because usually what I do is like to hire business consultants and train them how to use access. So That is the definition of the community college student. So, yeah, it's great. Great, great. Thank you very All much right. for your time. Well, thank Bye. you very much, everyone. And we'll see you next month. Advance Microsoft Access with SQL Server. Leslie, good luck. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. So Bye. long.